Welcome, 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 everybody. My name is Lauren Bailey. My friends call me LB. I'm the founder of Girls Club and Factor 8, and I'm really excited to bring you an awesome panel today. Uh, we'll introduce ourselves in just a moment, but the topic for today is how to get promoted to sales management faster. But we're going to go wide. We're going to talk about is management right for me? We're going to talk about how do I get there faster? And for those of you who have gotten there already, we're going to talk about how to survive that first year. So we're going to give everybody a minute to come in. May I suggest, please, that you already open up your chat and your Q&A. We're going to do our best to leave time at the end so that we can answer all of your questions. In the meantime, ladies, do you want to give a wave? Hello. This is always the awkward part as you're waiting for everybody <laughs> to join. Like, do we talk? Do we not talk? What do we do? What do we do? I'm going to start by thanking our sponsors in a huge way. So Nicole, you know, I'm going to start with Chorus. Yeah, baby. Chorus has been our title sponsor since our inception. That's three years. We've had, Angela, you can probably correct me. I think by now we're probably at about like 85 or 90 promotions under our belt at Girls Club. And literally none of that would have been possible without Chorus helping make Girls Club possible. So we're very, very grateful. We're also grateful to Outreach. It's so fun. Every time we talk about Outreach, my chat blows up with everybody who loves using Outreach. And I know so many use Outreach and Chorus together for that one-two punch. So that's fantastic. Thank you for sponsoring us. Thank you for making Girls Club possible. And of course, to Factor 8, I know the president over there, they donate all of our uh, curriculum and they make it possible as well. All right, here we go. Today's topic is how to get promoted to sales management faster. But like we said, nothing's off limits. How do I get into management? Should I get into management? Why should I get into management? Why should I not get into management? How do I survive management? So we're going to make this really tip rich, really in the girls club way, authentic and vulnerable. I'm going to let all my panelists introduce themselves. And here is a quick tip. Most of us have never done this before. So we have the inaugural run of many of our panelists, which makes me tremendously proud. That's what we're about at Girls Club is help and shine the spotlight. Nicole, would you introduce yourself first, please? Yes, thank you, Lauren. Hey, everyone. Nicole LaBarbera. I'm Regional Vice President of Sales at Chorus AI. I lead the enterprise sales team at Chorus. Really excited to be sharing my perspective as someone who's in management uh, many moons ago, around nine years ago, led a team. And when I jumped uh, into tech sales, knew I always wanted to make my um, way back into leadership. So leading that frontline team and I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you so much. So many neat perspectives, right? So if you're hearing and you hear enterprise, great. If you're hearing managed before, managing again, great, right? Um, in a huge company, great. So she can answer all of those perspectives. Becca. My name is Becca Henriquez. I am the Inside Sales Manager for Diabetes Supply. We're in Omaha, Nebraska. And I'm really excited to bring my perspective on when I was put into a lead position when I was not ready. And then when I was ready for a management position. I just think that's so brave. Thank you for that, right? I did it, I hated it. I maybe wasn't great at it. <laughs> and then I came back to it and I, that is one in a million. So I'm really excited to hear your perspectives on that. Thank you. Katie, could we have a bit of an announcement right now maybe? I think that would be fantastic. Um, my name is Katie Pollock. I am a sales development manager with Sendoso. And officially I have stepped out of an interim role into a permanent role with the company. Woohoo! That's so good. This is how the hearing impaired do claps, by the way. It's not just spirit fingers. It is actually applause in American Sign Language. Congratulations. When Katie joined Girls Club, along with others from Sendoso, who's a, a lovely sponsor of ours as well, you were going for the interim position, right? So you were a hopeful team lead when we first met. Then you were an interim team lead. And now, are you in your first month? First month of management? as a sales development manager, um, started in January in the interim. What an amazing perspective you're going to have for us. So the fact that you are like up and showered and breathing already, right? <laughs> well done you. Angela, hello, love. Hello, how are you? <laughs> I'm, good. I'm good. I'm at the river, so I'm happy. Yes, yes. 
Uh, my name is Angela Salazar, and I'm the program director for Girls Club, which is basically a dream job to support women in their leadership journeys. Um, I have been in some sort of leadership role, um, leadership development, recruiting management, um, sales operations for over 14 years. At one point, leading a team of 120 sales reps with about 10 managers. So I'm here today to give the perspective of that hiring manager and what I look for in sales leaders and, and how um, you can prepare yourself to be a leader. I just love that because it's it's also the loving perspective, right? Nobody wants your success, whether you're male, female, binary, non-binary, more than Angela Salazar. And so that's what she does for a living in Girls Club. But the fact that in her past lives, she's hired reps, she's hired managers. At one point you were managing over a hundred sellers, right? Yes. And been a recruiter, she's got every different perspective on this. So we're looking for pure gold. Here's what we're going to cover. No pressure, Angela, right? Pure gold. <laughs> pure gold. But only that. Don't mess it up. Yeah. Um, how do we decide if management's right for you? We're going to start there. We're going to get into what to expect in your role. We're going to get into tips to get promoted fast. And we're going to leave time for questions. If you don't have your questions typed into the Q&A, not chat, okay, ladies? I love the chat blowing up already. And thanks for following us all already. Sarah, we'll do the same. Um, then I won't leave time for it because I've got like a million questions myself, okay? So if it's burning, get it in the Q&A, not in the chat. So what I'm going to do now that's very important is stop the sharing so that we can dive in and get real. First question, how can you tell if management is actually right for you. Becca, I'm going to you first. When you are actually ready to start coaching your team instead of playing in the team. Yeah. I went, like I said, I went from a lead position from basically just so I can get a pay raise. I was a lead and I was the most unapproachable person, terrible person. And luckily with our change of leadership that we had and just seeing what great leaders do, it made me want to be that person and want to be better. You know, I love that you say that because I work with thousands of new and hopeful managers over my very long, yes, my picture is airbrushed career. And it, like, I can tell just by the way they answer that first question, what got you into management, if they're going to make it or not. And believe me, if it's for the money or for the status, they're not going to stay long. You have to love it. You have to want to develop other people, right? 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And I love the fact that you're vulnerable enough to be like, I just really wanted the money and didn't want anybody to bother me. So good call. Good call. No, Nicole, how about you? You've, you've done this twice also, right? Yeah, I, I have. Um, it was something that really felt very natural to me, like something that I would just always do. Uh, but when I went into tech sales and, you know, started as a BDR, then worked my way up um, into an enterprise sales role, um, I had to do a little bit of self-reflection. Mm -hmm. So I just had to think about, what did I enjoy most about my job and where did I get my energy from uh, both as an individual contributor and then what I imagined um, I would get from leadership. So as an IC, you get to control your own calendar. Yeah. You have total control over your time and day, yeah. right? Obviously you have um, metrics and, and revenue goals that you need to hit. Um, but a lot of that is within your control yeah. as a leadership. Some of that is taken away. A lot of it's taken away. A lot of it's taken away. But I started thinking about what I loved most in the IC role. And a lot of that was around how I strategized with my team on deals, how I really quarterbacked an entire deal and collaborated with other parts of the organization and the relationships and how I was able to develop uh, people like my BDRs in the past. Very, very fortunate to have really, really good relationships with some of those folks. So I knew that you know I was ready to be a coach. It was something that I was always passionate about doing. Um, so after I kind of did that self-reflection, I talked to people I trusted. So not just my peers, but any sales mentors, former managers that I had. Um, and I was really fortunate. I had a very good friend who went into a sales leadership role, maybe like months before me. Oh, nice. She was able to give me really like the good, the bad and the ugly. And uh, it just the good overweighed, every, like outweighed everything. Okay. So that's exactly what we should consider ourselves from here on out. Like we're the girlfriends who just got into management. Right. We're here to give everybody else tips. I want to translate really quick. I see she's saying individual contributor, sales, yeah. rep, sales executive, right? The move yeah. from, and yeah. I have to tell you that that is one of the biggest hard stops that new managers have is like, people don't do what I tell them to do. Um, I, it's hard. Like 
you cannot control how much other people care. It's true. And that is hard. Yeah. It's just, and you can't care more than they do. And that's really hard. So anybody who's vigorously nodding with me is obviously taking a trip into management. So, all right, I'm going to switch it just a little bit for Katie and Angela, your first question. How can you tell if you're ready? So the, they told us how they could tell they wanted it, right? Is it, does that bring up anything different for you? Katie, you first. Yeah, so to kind of piggyback off of what Nicole said, where I was sharing my strategies and tactics with, uh, with my peers, as well as celebrating their wins. Um, and so I knew I was ready when I was confident in the role that I had and wanted to take it a step further to see how I could impact uh, the most amount of people and uh, management seemed like the, the best opportunity to do that. So what I hear you saying is you were naturally also drawn to cheerleading others, right? But you knew you were ready when you felt confident in doing that. And what that says to me is I get that I have something to add. Is that fair? That's fair, yes. Yeah, because there's, listen, I was, gonna, I was gonna ask this later, but this is a really good opening. Like, can we just bring up imposter syndrome for a minute? I know that when I first started in management, I, I was 24 years old and I literally bought fake reading glasses so I would look older because I did not feel credible at all. And you bet I felt like an imposter and I did for my first probably three years. So Katie, are you saying that some of that went away for you and that's how you knew you were ready? I think it really boiled down to being able to trust my team to do the job at hand. Um, when I was meeting with my manager to take that feedback that was given and implement that into my day-to-day -day routine and uh, mm -hmm. just look for opportunities to grow as a leader uh, within the role. Nice. I like that. We can't assume we come in knowing it all. We have to be vulnerable and open to that development. You know, you don't apply for and go for management when you're 100% ready. Could we just make that could we all agree with that and just shout that loudly, please? If you wait until you're 100% ready, you're never gonna get there. So you're gonna have to go when you're still scared, when you still have a percentage of that confidence, but maybe a bigger percentage of imposter syndrome. Anybody else wanna to cop to or tell us about that for them? Uh, I'll just, make, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll just make a comment here. Uh, you know, I think imposter syndrome is something that I've heard about as a woman in sales, woman in tech for years and years and years, feeling like you're not ready or not necessarily that you don't deserve a seat at the table. But frankly, I, I don't think we should be asking this question anymore. I think the more we ask it, the more it amplifies those feelings of self-doubt. Because nobody and asks a man if they have imposter syndrome. You, you do not hear that on if this was a panel of all men. So that's just what I would kind of challenge us as, as women leaders here to kind of banish that from our- I love it. I love it. And I think you're right. But I will tell you that I do hear it from men as well. Hmm. I think they're just not as brave about talking about it. Like nobody did a TEDx that was a dude and talked about having imposter syndrome. So I love that we are brave do it. <laughs> right? Let's get one out there. Um, yeah. I love that we're brave enough to admit the fact we don't have all the answers and we feel unprepared and we feel underconfident. But I'm 100% taking that note to quit giving it airtime, right? At least I'm not going to call it that anymore. Well done, you. Thanks, Nicole. That's awesome. All right. So, Angela, I haven't got, gotten to you yet. How can you tell when you're ready? And, and if you don't mind the challenge, how could you tell as a hiring manager other people were ready? Yeah, I think that um, there's a couple of things that I look for. One of those is self-awareness, right? So somebody who can have that conversation about what they are comfortable with, what they're not comfortable with. Um, you know, when you ask that question about what are your opportunities that are not, that are giving real examples, right? Like that's one of those that's like, oh, I care too much. And you don't wanna hear that. You wanna hear like, well, you know, I've never managed, you know, a dashboard and had to, you know, assign KPIs to people, yeah. things, things of that nature where they're really real and, and really honest. Angela, Sarah just put one into chat. She says, brutal truth. I'm struggling to learn how to move to being an actual coach rather than what I do now, which is doing their work for them. Yeah. So that's the kind of answer you want to hear. 
It is. It's the kind, it's absolutely the kind of answer I want to hear because I'm looking for, I guess it goes back to, I'm looking for coachability, right? I want somebody that has some self-awareness because that allows them to be coachable. Somebody that thinks they have it all together is not necessarily going to be the most coachable person, whether that's very guarded because they think that they have to be perfect or whether they actually just think that they have it all down. Um, that, that, that makes me nervous as a leader. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we also have to look at um, someone that has shown and built credibility along the way. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you're the number one performer, because uh, let's make it clear, the number one performer does not always translate to being the best manager. Sometimes and you're I think it never does. I, I, I have learned to never hire the number one performer. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a tricky thing. I think that the number one performer has to show that like, that they're, they're ready for the right reasons. As Becca mentioned before, if you're looking for title, if you're looking for um, an office, if you're looking for the pay, and those are your primary drivers, it is not going to work out well for you. And I am looking, I am looking for those things. Yeah. Why do you want to be into management? If that answer is not all about other people, that's a huge red flag for me. I even look at it in a resume, right? If they aren't talking about um, lo the loving developing people and their objective or wanting to help a team succeed, mm -hmm. those are those are things that are really going to show me because the money is not going to make it last the title. You're going to get over it. If you don't, if you're not in it for those other people, it, it's not going to last. Yeah, I do have to agree. They, they something about light bulbs in the answer, but then here's the other one I really like is when they say, I think I can do it better. Like I want to make an impact, even if it's not about the people, just something about making an improvement. Mm -hmm. And, and listen, if you're listening to this thing, Oh crap, that's not, me or wait a minute, I am in it for the money. It's okay to think of it as a perk. <laughs> it's okay if yes. you're pumped about yeah. having an office. It just can't be the reason. Right. That, like I could not wait to have a door. And and the company where I grew up, I had to get to a director for that. But like to not book your OBGYN appointments in the middle of a sales floor is heaven. Like let's just be <laughs> honest about that. Super fair okay. point. <laughs> yeah. So look deep about what you love to do. And if you're in it for the win and the deal you will be sadly disappointed when you get into management. That's the other way to look at it. It's not just that, you know, Angela wouldn't pick you. I love blaming it on you. I wouldn't pick me. But it's because you're going to be sorely disappointed because the stress goes up and the dollar per hour <laughs> goes down. Right? Angela, everything you described was me three years ago. <laughs> yeah, All the bad it. was me three years ago. Come on, tell us about it. I, like I said, I got my promotion to the lead position mainly because of the pay. I was the most unapproachable person. I was the least coachable person. I, my nose was stuck in the air. If people had questions, it was use your resources and figure it out. <laughs> it's, and why? I'm not here to help you. Somebody comes to you. Were you just annoyed? Were you like, how did you feel at the time? I would just be annoyed. Yeah. I'm doing my job here. I'm trying to sell back up. That was 100% my mindset. Everything was, no, it's just me. Because at that time, I did not really have a team underneath of me. I was promoted to a lead position. And at the time, I was just me. I was the only person really doing what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And so when I would get questions, I was so annoyed because I'm like, this isn't my thing. Why, why are you asking me for help? That's not my job to help you. I mean, I literally so was- job the description could have helped maybe too. I mean, it was terrible. Every, I mean, even the coworkers that we have currently that were there, you know, three years ago to see the old me are like, I cannot believe how much you have grown over the last three years. We can't move on until you tell us about the change, right? So somebody finally told you you were an asshole and you got out of management. And then how did you get back? So I never left that lead position. What happened was we actually had a change in leadership. We had a new CEO. We had a new operations director. And I've met your CEO director. And lovely. What was that? I've met your CEO. He's lovely. Uh, have you, John? Yeah. He is wonderful. Yeah. Um, Chrissy, who is my operations director, I was the first person that she was going to fire. She was like, she is just an asshole. She is not approachable. I mean, I literally was the first person on her chopping block. 
And it's funny because one of the other managers that we have, Michaela and Chrissy are actually friends outside of the office as well. And so before Michaela even met me, she knew all about how terrible I was because Chrissy would tell her off, you know, when they were doing so their own do with mean girls. Yes, we need mean girls out. So, <laughs> so somebody finally told you you were a mean girl and gave you a chance to turn it around. Basically, we sat down finally and just had a conversation one day about what I was expecting and what she was expecting. And I finally just gave her that chance because when she came in, I'm like, she has no idea what the hell I do. I'm not going to listen to her. I'm not going to explain to her what I do because she doesn't even know. And finally, one day it was just, you know, you got brought on here for a reason. Let's do this. Let's give each other a chance. Wow. Okay. So I like, it's a cautionary tale from both perspectives, isn't it? And we have, if you've been in management, you have had a Becca, <laughs> a former Becca. <laughs> right? The, the superstar who don't need you. And so don't give up, sit down and talk it through. And I just love your vulnerability in being able to tell us about that growth. It's good. It right. made me me. It made it yeah. made it sore where I'm at today. Yeah. I love it. Thank you for that. That's brave. All right. So let's shift a little bit and talk about getting it. Okay. Katie, you are pretty new officially in this position. What's the toughest part? I think the toughest part was gaining that that confidence uh, to do the the job uh, well, uh, managing a large team with so many new hires. Um, but with all good things, it does take time. And as I you know gained more tenure in the role, got into the groove of management, um, I I did gain that confidence. And um, I think that the people on my team in turn did as well. Nice. Thank you for that. Confidence changes everything, doesn't it? it does. We waste so much time worrying and spinning and, and not helping people when we doubt ourselves. It's good. Nicole, how about you? What, what do you think is the toughest part? I'll go to everybody on this. Yeah, I, uh, I was thinking about a, a phrase that came up in one of my past sales onboardings, and we used to call it the trough of disillusionment. So oh when my you, God, I know this. You know this? Yeah. So it's, think of it as like a reverse bell curve. You come into a new role, you're pumped. You think you, you know it all because you got the job. You're, you're just so excited to get out there. Then you start to realize how little you know and you end up down here at the bottom. So <laughs> kind of the same thing in management because not only is it a knowledge gap around everything that you need to know but it's kind of a core skills gap as well. Uh, it's so, a core skills gap. Exactly. So I was really, really fortunate though, I will say at Chorus, within I think my first few weeks of joining to have some really incredible management training um, brought on site. And we really dove into like, what are those core skills of, of managers, of great managers? Yeah. So everything from coaching to how you give and receive feedback, how are you able to communicate not only with your direct reports, but across different levels of the organization? And then finally, how are you prioritizing your day and going out and executing? Oh my God, all of that is brilliant. And can I tell you the trough of disillusionment also includes this feeling of, I'm not managing a team of me's. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm yeah. sorry. You are an A, you're a superstar. You will never have a team of all you's. Get there. Yeah. Angela, toughest part. And then we're going to go into how do we get this job? I think that I, I, I would echo Katie in the, um, in the confidence piece. So um, I'll go back to my, my perspective as somebody that's uh, that's hiring, and um, I, I would encourage people to apply. Right, like that's the first step is actually going for the job, and that confidence gap is really where it's tricky to even throw your hat in the ring. Um, you may not get the role, like, but the interview experience and the feedback and making sure you're asking for the feedback after an interview is so so critical. And then once you move into that role, it is asking for resources and asking for support. Um, it sounds like, you know, Becca talks about how she just kind of went and did it her own way. And she didn't necessarily have that leadership support. Yeah. So when you start going down that, that you know, that bell, um, I think that that's where it's really important to say like, oh, crap, <laughs> like I need a little bit of help or I really pictured it one way. And I think that that's where you are at the top. And that's why you feel confidence because you really feel like you can picture it. I can envision myself. Oh yeah, because I'm a great seller. Yeah. I am great at this and I love people. I'm going to rock it. And I can recognize what 
all of my past managers did wrong. Oh, I can bring what they did right. You know, yeah. I know what I don't want in a manager. So you come in with all of those things and you think you have it mostly worked out. And it's a little bit of a reality check. And that's where the support comes in. And yes. you need to help find that support internally yes. within your company, externally, if you have to go there, if you yes. don't have the right leadership. You know, we ask the girls club that every year, what percentage of you have management or leadership development opportunities at your companies? Angela, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the number is 23%. I think, yep. Yeah, I think it was 22. You're almost exactly right. Yeah. Uh, so it's, and listen, I've been developing that stuff for years. It's not easy. It's time consuming. It's expensive to build. So ask for it if you have to go and outsource it, right? That's what Girls Club is about, by the way. Mm -hmm. All right, Becca, your toughest part. And then I'm going to have you start the, and how do you get recognized for it, right? Like, how do I get this job if I want it? So my toughest part was getting out of the game. I'm still working on that. I'm so busy still trying to do what I did before instead of focusing on how to make it better. Oh my God. So that was the absolute toughest part. Ladies and gentlemen, no, you can't keep any accounts. No, stop. Your job is not to sell anymore. Stop buying sales books and go buy management books. <laughs> Sorry, that's the hardest need part. A moment to underline that. <laughs> going. And then, so when I was actually ready for it, I sat down with my director and I'm just like, I'm ready for more. It was probably four or five months after she came on and I sat down after coaching. She gave me all the coaching for four or five months and I finally just started absorbing all of it. I sat down in her office one-on-one and I'm just like, I'm ready for more. And I swear, when I told her this, she's like, thank Jesus, finally. (laughs) She's like, you're finally saying something. Yeah. So I just had to literally sit down and explain what I wanted. Yes. Okay, good. So so let's dive into that for a second, right? I know that we have a lot to cover, but this is important. mm -hmm. Having the conversation is first. Okay. So when you're getting ready to be ready is when you have the conversation. I'm thinking about management someday, right? Then as you're actually feeling ready or closer to ready, you should have probably applied by once by then to get the experience. Then you're going in and actively applying. Prove me right or wrong. Tell me about the real truth in that. Like, how do you have the conversation? How do you get noticed? Katie, let's start with you. Tell us your story. Yeah. So with me, uh, I sought out a, an, an internal mentor. Uh, that was my VP of inside sales. Um, I asked to meet with him. Joe. Joe, yes. Joe Venuti, VP of inside sales. Um, I was expecting to meet with him on maybe a monthly basis. And he actually carved out time for me to meet with him on a weekly basis. Um, really introducing me to Girls Club as the summer program was going on. Uh, one of the sales development managers was go- about to go on maternity leave. And I raised my hand uh, to step in to that position in the interim and and really just meeting with him up until that point uh, created an internal champion for myself to where it was almost like a natural progression for me to be in that role because I had prepared for it ahead of time. Oh, that's so good. There's a ton of gold in here, you guys. So Mm -hmm. step one is go and find yourself an internal, we call it an advocate, right? Angela, can you describe to people what that is and why it's so critical? Um, an advocate. So I, I like to say, I want somebody that will, you know, wave my flag, right? You go in there and it's somebody that you talk to, you share your goals with them, and then you ask them for support. And Lauren knows this about me. I am one who appreciates, of course, I appreciate the kudos. Of course, I appreciate the love we all do, but I will then pause and say, okay, what, what else can I do? What do I need to do better? Because ultimately, while you need the confidence boost of the good stuff, you also need to give, sometimes you need to give your leaders permission to be real with you. Because sometimes you have people that want to like, you know, support you with kid gloves and say like, oh, you're super great and you're getting there, but you need somebody that'll say, you're amazing. Here's what I want you to be able to do. I would love it if you could run a team meeting so we can practice that skill and give you different opportunities. But then you and need wait, somebody to really ask for those. Yes. Ask for those if they're yes. not giving it to you, right? So yes. step one, find the person. Step two, really invite the feedback, the Angela Salazar way, which is like, I'm sorry, no, you have to like keep looking. No more, more. And then if they're not giving it to you, ask for the chance to step in. 
if there's not a full-time interim like Katie had, leading the team meeting, doing some coaching, leading a huddle. Thanks, Angel. Sorry, I just had to underline that real quick. No, it's perfect. And it you, you see this in Katie and in Nicole and Becca. There's this like level of personal accountability, right? And nobody's, Lauren, you've said it. Nobody wants this as much as you. And you have to sometimes be the driver. Sometimes we look out with amazing leaders that really look out for you. But you have to say, what? why wouldn't you hire me as a, as a manager? What can I do? What do I need to work on? Because if they say, no, you're great, you're perfect. Well, when that next interview comes around, you, you should be getting that role, right? That's, they're kind of signing you up for it. If somebody says nothing, you're perfect, go find a different advocate. Yeah. On your team. <laughs> That's just the truth of it because you're not going to get development there. And, and somebody you need not them to wave your flag in, in the other rooms, right? When they're talking to other leaders, they need, you want them saying like, Katie is amazing. And she is, she is a part of the future of this organization. Mm -hmm. And you need that. That's, that's what an advocate is. Okay. So somebody help me with the specifics. So this is Christine's question, by the way, how do you actually have the conversation with the executive team that you're ready for this, right? She feels confident that she's ready to be a coach, but she's not sure that they know. So you pick somebody who you think you want to have be your advocate or your internal mentor, right? And yes, it's somebody higher who's going to be in those hiring rooms. How do you go up and say, hi, my name's Lauren and I'd like to be a future leader. Anybody want to take that one? Well, like I was saying, I literally just opened her door and had a seat in her, the seat in front of her and said, this is what I want. You just do it. Nice. I just did it. Good job. We, by the way, do have an entire webinar on that. You can find on the Girls Club blog, <laughs> which is how to ask for the promotion. And we spent half that time talking about how to tell them earlier that you're feeling ready. So go check that out, Christine. Oh, this is all good stuff. All right. So we went off when I was talking about getting the job, right? And Becca, you talked about, listen, I just said, I'm ready, right? Katie, you found Joe as an internal advocate, and then he groomed you for the job. Anybody else want to share some insight on that? Tips on getting the job? I mean, I have kind of a, a roundabout way that I ended up in my role here. Um, Tiago, our chief revenue officer, uh, was my manager, I, I believe, seven years ago. So it was a long, long time ago since I worked for him. Um, but we just formed an incredible relationship, very, very trusting very accountable to each other. And I was a top for, performer. Um, so the relationship that I built seven years ago, where I was very vocal at that time, I was not ready to go into management, but that I wanted to go back into it, ended up coming full circle when I was ready. Okay. So, so wait, started, walk me through that again. You were vocal, but you knew you weren't ready. Yeah. I, I said, I know that I want to go back into management one day. My focus right now is to be the best sales executive that I can be to go make a lot of money, work with you to develop my skills. But one day this is where I wanna be again. So then he found himself at right the top, uh, top of the pole here at, at Chorus. And we started talking about my develop again. Now, I think six or seven years later, and this is how I'm in this role. I think that's fantastic. And um, when I hear women tell me that very same thing in girls club, I applaud it, right? When we have the wherewithal to not just have the blind ambition, and say, yeah, I think someday, but for now, that shows the self-awareness you were talking about, doesn't it, Angela? It does. And it, it sounds like Nicole built credibility. That's what she did over that time. And she did it on her own timeline, which is, which is perfect. I think, I mean, it's never too early to have the conversation, right? Like you can say it in your interview. Ultimately, you know, I'm coming into this role. I want to prove to you that I'm a rock star, that I'm responsible, that I'm um, reliable, right? You got to be there. Let's, I mean, you can't forget about attendance. <laughs> like that's definitely something I'm looking for. If you're, if you can't be there, if you're not reliable, um, please don't even talk to me about getting promoted. Um, so I, just to throw that one out there. Um, but once you kind of build that credibility and you are ready, like it, it, it's one thing to go in and say, I'm ready to be a manager. When are you going to make me one? Right. That's not the conversation to have. The conversation is, Hey, I'm signing. I want you to know down the road, this is where I want to be. And so it's never too early to have that conversation. 
It's laid the groundwork. groundwork. Yeah. So let's pick up on this thread of credibility, please. Okay. Because so many of us are out there and I see it in the questions, right? Like, but wait, how do I throw my hat in the ring and how do I get noticed? And how do I, how do they, you know, how do I do this really? So credibility is huge. It has to start there. Making sure you always do what you say you're going to do and are always on time. That's number one from Angela. Nicole, can I ask you next? How do you build credibility with leadership? Building credibility with leadership. I mean, in sales, it's pretty black and white. Um, do you have the track record of success? And also just taking a look at the reputation and brand you've built in the business. Mm -hmm. So how well do you work with other teams? Do your solutions consultants, your BDRs, your heads of product, your product marketing managers want to work with you? Yes. Like, at the end of the day, you're building, like you said, that army of people who are going to wave your flag. And it, it's in how you treat not only your customers, but your colleagues as well. I love that you say that. Your peers will raise you to yeah. the level, right? That you deserve. That, that is what happens. You see people who are great at managing up, see some that are great at managing down, but it's really the peer relationships that shows you the authentically fantastic leader. And I want to borrow the words you said before, Nicole, of quarterbacking deals, mm -hmm. right? You may need people from finance. You may need people from, you know, marketing, from all kinds of different departments. And if you're the person who can pull them together, versus the jerk everybody walks away from when they see you coming. It's a big difference. Love that. Really, really good. And like you said, there's a lot of black and white in sales. Does not mean you have to be the top rep. We said earlier, I'm wary of the top rep. I, I look for a good solid B performer who is always putting in the effort. It's the right attitude also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you need somebody that's positive and somebody that's solution oriented. If it's a if it's somebody that's whiny and complains and is constantly in my office telling me what's wrong, that's that's an issue. If they're coming to me and saying, "Hey, I noticed this. I have an idea." It might not even be the right idea, but that's what I'm looking for. I love that. That's good. All right, Becca, Katie, and then Katie, talk to us about building credibility. You can talk it all day, but you have to live it. If you are saying that you're doing this, um, telling you know others what you're looking to do, that's one thing, but they actually have to be able to see you doing it. They have to see you living by it. Words only take you so far. Okay, very true. It's very true. Proof's in the pudding, Katie. Absolutely. How do you think you built the credibility? Um, I think it was probably um, through uh, consistently hitting quota, overachieving, having that track record track record of getting promoted, uh, taking on additional responsibilities outside the scope of my role mm -hmm. and asking for, for more. Um, just really kind of identifying that I was ready for more, uh, documenting and showcasing those wins, whether that be when you're having your conversation with your manager or utilizing uh, your LinkedIn profile. Yeah, nice, really good. Building that brand is something that Nicole said and you were doing that as well. So you're collecting the wins. You're asking for more. You're not going and saying, give me the money and the promotion, and then I'll take on additional responsibility. You're saying, I'm going to prove to you I get the promotion by taking on additional responsibility. Okay. Now, I want to pause here for a second because I've met some lovely women who have been doing that for three to five years. And that's a no-no as well. Okay. Don't do three jobs for free. Not okay. So there's, there is an instance of getting taken advantage of there. All right, let's get tactical again in preparing for the role. Top skills that you need to build or that you notice right away in management were things you had to go figure out and get training on. Um, I'm going to go first this time to Becca, please. Coaching, <laughs> just leading by example. Um, like I said, I was a terrible person. I was not coachable. I was not approachable. Just learning and absorbing the coaching that I received to be able to do for my team as well. That way they can have the best version of me. I just want to hug you every time you say that now. <laughs> you were a <laughs> terrible person. You were just a shitty boss. <laughs> I was. I was terrible. A hundred percent. All right. So when you say coaching, I think one thing and everybody else thinks something slightly different. Can you dig into that for me? What do you mean by coaching? What specific skills do I need to go learn? So 
So it's, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Ah. So for instance, you know, Hey, you really screwed this up. I need you to be better. You cannot say that to your, (laughs) you have to, you know, Hey, you're really great at this. Um, let's work on this. Like we were discussing earlier with, you know, the team calls, let's work on your team calls. That way you can lead the team meetings. Yeah. It's going to them with that aspect instead of just telling them all the bad and coaching them and leading by example. So they can see, Hey, if you're doing it, this is really what I should be doing. So you can tell them all day, we need to do it this way, this way, and this way. But unless you are doing it, it's going in one ear, not the other. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're very right. Um, so there's a couple specifics in there. When I hear coaching, the, the style of management that is coaching is the style of coaching via questions versus statements. But the other thing you brought in there was maintaining self-esteem. And that's huge. Building people up. Um, it's a skill that is tough. Um, it takes managers a long time to get good at that. I, I like to try and shoot for the five to one ratio, five add girls in one improvement point. And I know that sounds massive, but the reason we're shooting for that is so that you'll land at like one and a half. <laughs> All right. That's your top skills. Love it. Katie, Nicole, and then Angela. I think it, it really is um, for, for me, I knew how to do the job and being able to kind of translate that to the people on my team. Uh, but just how you had mentioned, Becca, in terms of uh, it's, you know, not just what you say, it's how you say it. We're all in this remote environment. Mm-hmm. Um, it's Slack and Zoom calls. And so being able to, to take the feedback from my manager that I, in my first couple months it, as a manager, was coming off a little bit too harsh when I was speaking to the people on my team, uh, being able to implement that, that feedback and, and take that into consideration in every single conversation that I have via Slack uh, to show that I am on, I'm on their team. I'm willing to go to bat for them. And so that team first mentality uh, is definitely one of the skills and in turn, um, you know, effective communication. I love that team first and coachability. Yeah. Love that. I listen, and you're not alone. My first boss, not my first boss, but my favorite Jim Kiebert sat me down and said, Lauren, you're leaving bodies by the side of the road. And I was like, well, that's because they don't move fast enough. And clearly it's their fault. So it took me a few years to catch on to that. <laughs> Nicole. Yeah, I would say, so, I mean, those are on my list as well. Coaching, the ability to give good, actionable, direct feedback. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to jump to the fourth skill that I listed earlier, which is really around prioritization and execution. I knew that my manager's schedule, my calendar was going to be crazy. And now I've lived it. That back to back to back to back to back day. And I have six reps on my team. You have to understand and prioritize diligently what is the most important things that you need to get done in order to drive results while coaching your team effectively, building amazing relationships, providing feedback in a direct and actionable way. So uh, just finding tools to help you um, go out and, and prioritize and um, get things done uh, is very, very important skill. Could not agree more. That time management and prioritization is huge. I had a guy in my management boot camp this summer who had, let me get the number right, 42 reps. Crazy. What do you even, do, you even do right? All right, Angela, top skills. Um, so uh, I have two that come to mind. The first one, servant leadership. If you don't know about servant leadership, I I strongly encourage you to go and read about it. That's the team Um, mentality that Katie. The the gist of it is that as a leader, my job is to make your job easier, to remove hurdles, to help with some solutions, to get you the resources that you need, the training that you need to identify those opportunities. The second thing I would say is learning how to have difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. Um, that can be a real challenge. Um, there's so many components to that. Some of it is policy, understanding, you know, when you're doing write-ups, um, who needs to be involved, how that needs to be handled, um, learning simple things like where should this conversation happen? Um, Lauren, you mentioned esteem, making sure that you're doing this all in keeping in mind that this is a person. Um, that more often than not, unless it's a termination, which also has its own guidelines, um, that the goal is to make them better, to correct something. 
Um, so you go back to your coaching skills, but that can be just very intimidating. So I think that there's definitely a learning curve around difficult conversations. Yeah, it's a really good one. And in fact, Muhammad put in our questions, don't you think emotional intelligence should be on this? And I think that that's the thread that comes through all of these. Very, very good. All right. So thank you for the list of skills. I'm going to go straight to the Q and A because there's so many that their questions are more important than the rest of my questions. So Muhammad, we just checked you off with emotional intelligence. Caitlin, I work on a small team at a small startup. I'd like to plan for my future, but I'm worried that I'm instantly going to identify that it's not within the scope of the company. Oh, do I hear this a lot. How can I plan or work with my current manager to plan for my future? And the implied question I hear here is, and what happens when it's not at my company? So I'll I'll share another girls club stat. We ask when everybody comes in, have you applied for management before, right? And it's usually around 50% have, 50% haven't. And the top reasons they haven't. Number one is I'm feeling unprepared or there's more to do in my current role. And that to me is us just citing perfectionism, right? Nobody's ready. But the another second one is, is they just don't aren't enough opportunities at my company. And that can feel sad. Right. And the truth is there are a million companies that are looking for you. Really good frontline managers are really hard to find. So if that's the case at your company, we're small, we're not going anywhere, but I want to get into management. How do I navigate that? Anybody dealt with that? Becca, I feel like you have something to say, but (laughs) I don't have, I see the situation is different because I, where I'm at, I never pictured myself where I'm at. Yeah. Um, I knew that I wanted to be within our company, yeah. but this is when the right people, right seat falls into place. It might be the right seat for you, but they don't have the right person in it currently. Mm-hmm. So just because there's not something open currently does not mean that they will not create one for you. Yes, hundred percent true. And I think it's okay. We'll let everybody else go around Robin on this, but I say, do it anyway. I say, listen, um, nobody expects that you're going to be in the job you were hired in for the rest of your life. Okay. And once you get into the role of leader or leader of leaders, you understand how critical it is to find and keep good talent. Okay. They're not looking to get rid of you. They're desperate to keep you. So have the conversation anyway and say, I'd like to get here someday. And if I can do it at this company, great. How can you help me? Anybody, would anybody give different advice than that? Would anybody say, keep it quiet? No, no. And with a startup, I think that there's, there's so many opportunities and there may be things that they don't know that they need. And this is that great time to go and say, here's something I recognize. Can I, can I try something and start showing them what you can do? And, and, and maybe they realize, oh crap, we, we actually need this. Maybe this is the right person to do this for us. hundred percent. Small companies are great for that. By the way, I built my own department right? Like we didn't have this. I'm going to go and build it, Mm -hmm. which is another great way to build credibility. So uncle Joe Venuti has a question in here too, saying you build credibility without the title. You do it first. Who else has a way that we haven't talked about yet on how you can build that credibility before you get the title? Katie, I know you've got an answer because you did it and Joe saw it. Yes, I did. And so in turn, I'm just taking on the normal role of an SDR, um, going out of my way to find additional opportunities to help create content for the sales team, as well as process documents for sales enablement for new hires to be onboarded and reference those as they gain tenure. That's a Um, great project. Documenting something that hasn't been documented before. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And then, um, then in addition to hitting quota, overachieving, looking for what's next, and raising your hand for an opportunity before it presents itself. There are always things that aren't there in organizations, even in big organizations. We don't have a call coaching form. We don't have a standard, uh, you know, one-on-one cadence. We don't have a, right, we need to clean up our pipeline gates and definitions. There's always projects to be done. So raising our hand for those are great. Anybody else want to jump in on that? Raising your hand and saying, I can help with new hire training right? Going and helping to be a subject matter expert. That's always a really good one. Some those people need help or when they come out on the floor being somebody that says, you know, they can sit next to me or they can, they can shadow me. 
um, that's a great one to be able to, to start showing your skills and saying that, you know, I want to support other people. Anna Baird is the COO at, I, wait, I think she's switched now to CRO, my bad, at Outreach, our sponsor for today. She was one of our featured women on our Wind Down Wednesday on Girls Club. And her best advice, I just loved, I've been stealing it ever since, Anna, by the way, um, is go, if you're not sure management's right for you, sign up to be that newbie mentor. Sign up to be somebody who helps a new person, whether it's all of them or one at a time. And if you find it annoys you, like it did Becca, it's not for you. If you find that you prioritize doing that over other things and you loved it, that's a sure sign that management's right for you. So it's two birds, one stone there. All right, um, here's a different question. Amanda, this is such a good one. When stepping into management and you were the number one rep, how do you get your peers from the sales team to accept you? I think it'd be even harder if it were the opposite. We've talked a lot about how don't hire your number one rep. I'm sorry, Amanda, I know that you're fabulous, but most number one reps are nightmares. That's just all there is to it. You all are high maintenance, super competitive, in it for me and the W kinds of sellers who don't translate seamlessly into I play well with others. I'm all about nurturing them. It's not me taking over the phone. I'm happy giving away my top accounts. All those things are sort of counter to your nature, which is tough, right? So whether you were a top sales rep or the not top sales rep, how do you build credibility with your team? Because when you're getting promoted from rep to manager, you're very likely managing people that used to be your peers. Katie, I'm going to go to you first on this. I can absolutely speak to that. I bet you could. I think, um, you know, going from an individual contributor into this management role, uh, you gain credibility uh, by demonstrating that you can consistently grow as a leader in the role, as well as develop and up level those people that are still in that sales role, uh, whether that be an internal promotion or, um, you know, up leveling them to, to the next role to further, uh, further enhance their career path. Good. So guess what? You are no longer being judged based on hitting your number. You're being judged on how you develop your people. And sure, you will be judged a little bit and commissioned on hitting a, a number on your team, but challenge yourself to actually be more interested in what percent of your team hit quota, right? We can all ride a top rep or deal, but how many of your people are you making successful? Gorgeous answer. Thank you. Anybody else want to jump in on that? I did not manage any of my direct coworkers when I got my management position, because like I said at first, it was just me for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, it took probably a good year for me to gain the respect as a manager from the ones that saw the old me. Mm -hmm. And it's just leading by example. Boy, that's tough. That is tough. Nicole or Angela, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I have a couple of examples. So in my very first management role, I was in that position still pretty early in my career and I uh, was promoted to senior director over two people who were about five to 10 years older than me. Yeah. And, you know, it, it could have gotten very um, uncomfortable very fast, but everything, you just have to prove yourself through your actions. Are you the type of manager that's going to go in there and be in the trenches with them, help solve problems? be empathetic at the end of the day, this job is about people. How well are you connecting with that individual and showing how much you care about them? Yeah. So Can we pause there for just a second? Cause that's so critical. Okay. Some of that is what leads to us feeling underconfident at the beginning. Bunch of people went for this role. I got it. Who am I to get it? They've been here longer. They sell better. They have nicer hair, whatever it is. Okay. So how do you prove yourself to them when you feel like an idiot in front of them? And Nicole's answer is you help them. And that is the answer that makes all the difference, right? You don't bravado up. You don't act like a big shot. You don't try to boss them around. You don't try to look cool. You don't, right? You don't put on a show. You take off the mask and you ask how you can help. Yeah. Thank you for that. Keep going. Yeah. Uh, and then I would just say in this role, coming in to lead the team at Chorus, uh, it's, bringing a little bit of your, your true and authentic self and having a little bit of the vulnerability that I might not have all of the answers, but I'm going to go in there and figure it out with you. To your point, help elim eliminate roadblocks, um, do whatever I can. And 
bring my wealth of knowledge as a, a leading sales to go help you win deals. So both of those hacks have been very successful for me. Thank you for that. That's beautiful. Angela, any last words on that? Be willing to share your secret sauce, right? So if you're a number one performer, it's not keeping it all close to the vest and being willing to say, here's what I found success, but then also being willing to understand that there's not just one way to that success. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit of both. It's a finding that right balance. Thank you for that. That's fantastic. All right. And last question I'm going to ask everybody to contribute to from the group was favorite books. I was yelling at people earlier. I do that. Stop reading sales books. Start reading management and leadership books. My favorite is cracking the sales management code. I think that helps people understand the metrics and the vast difference and world between goal and dials, which is critical to being a successful manager. Do you each have one or two favorites you'd like to recommend? Let's go to Katie, Becca, Nicole, then Angela. I think um, it would be Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg. Uh, funny enough, I did start reading that before um, I was interested in becoming a manager. And I think that that ultimately, um, you know, really motivated me to raise my hand. And uh, thankfully, I'm in the position now with a company that I love leading people who are just as excited to be there. Um, and in turn, you know, just learning, growing every day um, with, with a fantastic team. I'd like to reread that book 10 years later now, like my more confident self reading that. I wonder, what, like, I, there's probably a whole other level of message on that. Thank you. That's especially for the young women in the audience. Good. Becca. Mine would be Harvard's Business Review, 10 Most Reads on Managing People. And it's just 10 different stories in there that are giving real life examples and different perspectives from, from employee, you know, employee perspective and management perspective. And would it's just, it just makes it really real. Thank you. Would you put that in chat? Cause it was a long one. I would really appreciate that. Yes. Put it in for so everybody. I will do that. Thanks Katie, you too. Nicole. I, I still do read a lot of sales books, but one that I am listening to right now on Audible is a Radical, Radical Candor. So yeah, recommended by my uh, former sales leader and mentor um, at my prior company and really enjoying it. That was one of our book club books, wasn't it, Angela? It was, and it was going to be the one that I said as well. Oh, <laughs> the point of going last. Now you have to come up with a new one. Um, I would say Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. Yeah, she's another one that I love. I love, I love the personal professional development balance, yeah. you know, balance books. Those are the ones that tend to speak to me. Um, that talk about just relationships with people. Um, I think that it's, it's a people first role. And so there's, there's leadership, but there's also, you have to have the human connection. So I, I really lean, lean in towards books that have a little bit of that, of both of those. Yeah, I do too. And by the way, huge Audible fan to Nicole. Yeah. That's just the best. I've just like, I'll never do dishes and not listen to a book again. Exactly. My kids come into the kitchen and <laughs> stupid stories. <laughs> um, I have a really old tactical one I'm going to share again also it's called the leadership pipeline and the leadership pipeline talks about how when you go from individual contributor to manager you have to kind of switch everything and change directions and unlearn some stuff and go left and it really explains how and why people stop moving up in their careers the Peter principle is a principle for a reason and it explains that and it gives tactical examples of skills you need to work on to prepare for the next role. So speaking of that, I'm going to uh, use that as a segue to promote Factor 8's next boot camp, led by Angela Salazar, by the way. I wrote the curriculum. Angela does the training. It is um, pieces of what makes Girls Club so popular, but available to the public. It is six weeks long. It starts at the end of this month. Three classes you need if you are a new manager or wanting to get into management. This is key including the time management and prioritization, including translating some of those goals and numbers and what great management looks like, what we all wish we had when we started, okay? Live classes, e-learning classes, you get hundred bucks off with MGR 101 when you sign up, factorate.com forward slash managers. Huge thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Not just to Factor 8, but to Chorus who made all of this possible. I mean, like who just wants to work for Nicole at Chorus now? I'm hiring. 
Oh, Love look me. at that. <laughs> awesome. Feel free to chat that in, Nicole. Right. Feel free to chat that in. You've got a future advocate and mentor in Nicole. And thank you again to Outreach for making this possible and sponsoring us today and just having, again, a fantastic organization. I've never met a leader at Outreach that I wouldn't actually go and work for. And believe me, once you stop working in corporate America, it's hard to think about ever going back. So one more time, a thank you to our panelists. Please go and find them all on LinkedIn right now. Nicole is hiring from Chorus. Becca in Omaha, my Midwest girl, thank you so much for your vulnerability with us today. Katie, congratulations on the promotion. I've been hearing about you from Joe Venuti for years. We love Sendoso. And Angela, you make all things Girls Club possible. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Reach out to me if you have questions about Girls Club. Yeah, absolutely. We are girlsclub.com. Thank you, everybody. Have an awesome day. I can't wait to hear the success stories. Tell us what you got out of it. Contact us. Connect with me also on LinkedIn. And there's my personal email address if you've got questions. Have a fantastic day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.